Across the UK, across continental North America, and around the world on the internet by webcast and by podcast. My name is Howard Hughes, the last time I checked, and this is The Unexplained. Thank you very much for coming back to the show. If I sound a little um, almost demob happy, I'm not really demobbing. I'm just uh, very hot and very tired. We've had a little bit of a run. And uh, those of you who don't like me talking about the British weather at the top of the show, then tune out for five seconds. Uh, We've had a really hot spell here, and it's really, really close now. A lot of moisture in the air. And you know this is the UK, so we have that anyway. So when it gets warm with it, it really saps you. Been a really, really tiring week. Um, Done an extra shift in my uh, day job this week, so it, it just catches up with you after a while. So if you catch me rambling, tell me. I think you might just have. Thank you very much for your emails. I'm going to do uh, some shout-outs on this edition of The Unexplained. Thank you very much for getting in touch, for going to the website, theunexplained.tv. That's theunexplained.tv. The website designed and honed and maintained by Adam Cornwell at Creative Hotspot in Liverpool. Thank you for going to the website, sending me a message and your suggestions and thoughts. Your guest suggestions really useful. I'm working my way bit by bit through all of those. I have a list as long as your arm and beyond of those. If you can make a donation, and if you have recently, thank you, but if you can, I would be very grateful if you could do that. Remember, we are completely independent media, and you like the show. Let's keep it going. Let's develop it. Um, Guest on this edition, somebody else you suggested, Garnet Schulhauser, and we're going to be talking again about another aspect of the afterlife. Um, We'll leave this topic uh, aside uh, for a, a month or two. Uh, But I just wanted to come back to this because I think he will be very interesting, but you have to tell me. All right, shout-outs now. Uh, Ian in Runcorn, Cheshire, very close to Liverpool. Nice to hear from you, Ian. Uh, Says to me basically that I shouldn't listen to the critics and I should be true to myself. Also talks about something a few of you have mentioned, uh, the images from Mars Curiosity, one in particular, that appears to show... And as I record this, everybody's getting very excited in the uh, extraterrestrial and uh, space alien world. Um, Apparently, it shows a pyramid. Well, there is something that looks pyramidal, but there is no great idea, is there on this picture, of relative scale. So it could be a fragment of something that randomly looks like a pyramid, or it may be something that somebody built and left a long time ago. I think we need more uh, more evidence. Or maybe we're just being teased with little pieces, little scatterings of evidence here and there. And maybe this is part of the, the tapestry. Who knows? Uh, Richard Williams says that he can get me in touch with Ray Santilli through a friend of a friend. Um, I'll be in touch with you, Richard. Thank you. Phil S. Not impressed at all with Richard C. Hoagland. Uh, Deborah in Richmond. I've just dropped my papers in. Let me pick them up. Deborah in Richmond. <laughs> fully professional show this um sent me some wedding photographs i mentioned her and her wedding to turlow on the show i'm really pleased it went well and you know i wish you only the best both of you clint thatcher nice to hear from you again randy eckhart in a place in mexico that i think is called juanajato juanajato think so um some thoughts about carmen bolter thought that carmen bolter was hostile Uh, she certainly was very direct but very interesting i thought um anthony thank you for your email elmo thank you for the web posting about my show thank you uh rene uh takes on a recent guest who said in a show and i remember this that uh, tomatoes were once toxic uh rene says they never were lawrence in pretoria south africa south africa nice to hear from you lawrence really nice email and we exchanged emails about uh, various places that we know near cape town one of my favorite places on earth uh george at coast to coast am yes it was that george thank you for your email george nice to hear from you uh chuck evans in japan liked robert zubrin ed snowden had some show suggestions chris in winnipeg enjoyed robert zubrin but says he should uh, learn the difference between hybridization and gmo Okay, point taken. Tony Aura thought that uh, Zubrin was wonderful. Steve Light in Canada, not so impressed with Robert Zubrin. Stefania, um, your good thoughts and wishes greatly appreciated. Thank you, Stefania. Aurelie in New Zealand, a French person in New Zealand, or a person who speaks French in New Zealand. Bonjour, comment ça va, Aurelie? And that is more or less the limit of my schoolboy French, I'm afraid. I need to learn more. Rakesh, nice to hear from you. Thank you for the guest suggestions. Matthias in Stockholm. Uh, has been going through my back catalogue. Matthias, thank you for doing that. Marty, nice to hear from you again. Matt in Mornington, Victoria, Australia, an American living there. Nice to hear from you. Justine Lines, a very good 
uh, funding idea, Justine. Thank you for that. Uh, Lee Matrashia, uh, geospatial intelligence. Want to get doing a show about that, Howard. Okay. Donna in Berkshire in Maidenhead. Nice to hear from you, Donna. And uh, dropping my papers again. I think I need to get a proper table here. Um, Marcus, who works for a hospital in Liverpool. Nice to hear from you. Zoe, telling me that uh, the stories I tell of my own life on this show, she likes to hear. And Simo, or Simo in Herefordshire, thinks the same. Thank you. Uh, Jack, liked uh, Candace Talmadge and tells me a moving personal story. I hope you don't mind me passing this on. But he had a friend uh, who died, very sadly, and... Around the time that she died, a frog appeared at a pond that Jack has. And since she had a great sense of humor, he thinks, and we've heard this so many times, I know this in my own life, it may have been a sign. Yeah, but I think so. Uh, new listener, Kevin Morell in Nashville, Tennessee, home of WSM and the Grand Old Opry. Nice to hear from you. Rebecca in Roanoke. Nice to hear from you. And there's so many movies mention Roanoke, don't they? I've never been there. Uh, one of the places in America I hope to go. And finally, Steve Taylor and Steve Beasley. Thank you very much for getting in touch. Now, the guest on this show, I sort of teased this up at the beginning of this edition, didn't I? As I was rambling on in the heat here, is uh, Garnet Schulhauser. Now, this man practiced uh, corporate law with two big law firms in Calgary, Canada for more than three decades, but uh, retired to Vancouver Island in 2008. Garnet's life changed dramatically one day in 07, when he was confronted on the street by a homeless man called Albert, he says. Over the next few years, he had a series of conversations with Albert, who was actually a wise spirit guide in disguise, who disclosed startling new truths about life, death, the afterlife, and God. With a build-up like that, you wouldn't uh, want to miss the chance to listen to him, would you really? Garnet Schulhauser. Let's get him on uh, here at The Unexplained in Canada. Garnet, thank you very much for coming on. Thank you for having me, Howard. I'm delighted to be here. Well, I'm very, very pleased to have you on. You're another guest who my listeners have suggested, and I checked you out. You've got a, a certain amount of video online, haven't you, on YouTube? So I, I started there and uh, and worked my way back, and that's why I wanted to have you on here. So um, I hope you're going to enjoy the experience, Garnet. I certainly will. I, I read your biography, and uh, you, you had a, a pretty successful law career there, uh, 34 years of it. Uh, talk to me about that. Talk to me about your background. Well, yeah, I did practice law for 34 years. I was a corporate lawyer in Calgary in Canada, uh, so it was a very successful career. Um, prior to going to uh, law school, I was, uh, I was born and raised on a small farm in Saskatchewan on the plains of Canada, and I was raised in a very religious Roman Catholic family. Um, so I was an altar boy, uh, went to church often, followed all the rules. Um, and uh, it, it, this is all led by my mother, who is a feisty Irish lady who is determined to get her husband and five children into heaven, even if she had to drag <laughs> us kicking and screaming. And so that was the driving force. But by the time I hit my, my 30s, I was already questioning a lot of the things I was taught by the Catholic Church. And I started to reject a lot of their dogma uh, because it didn't make any sense to me. And then I sort of was casting about trying to find a new paradigm to latch onto. Um, and I kept on asking myself the eternal questions that everyone asks at one point or another, like, who am I? Why am I here? What's my life purpose? And what happens to me when I die? And then, uh, so then one day uh, in May of 2007, when I was still practicing law, I bumped into a homeless man who answered all of my questions. Right, no, and I, I actually talked about that uh, in the introduction to all of this. I read your uh, your biographical paragraph out uh, from your uh, biography on your website. So we've, we've got that degree of preparation. I'm just interested how somebody... I mean, look, you had two things militating against being interested in the things that you're now talking about. Number one, the Catholic Church, which tends to tell people that it has an answer for everything. Now, my family in Liverpool uh, are half and half, half Catholic, half the other way. So I see all sides of this. And, uh, you know, it was quite, um, you know, quite the family was quite involved with the Catholic Church. So I understand a bit about this. But they don't really go to the places where you've been going. Plus, of course, a legal training. That's as rational minded as you can get. There are two reasons why you shouldn't really be doing this. 
No, absolutely. And, and it was quite quite surprising to me, actually, because I was cruising along in my legal career, not thinking in the, in the least bit about, uh, you know, encountering a, a wise spirit on the street um, or, uh, you know, writing a book, uh, which eventually, because, of course, after I met my spirit guide, I, I wrote uh, my first book and my second book and the third one's on the way. Um, so that was totally, uh, totally un, unthought of by myself. And, and uh, certainly when... Uh, when I decided to come out of the spiritual closet after I met Albert and release my first book, Dancing on a Stamp, um, I knew it would shock a lot of my former law colleagues and clients and friends because I was just totally unlike a, a spiritual person when, it, when I was practicing law up, up to that point in well, time. Well, so let's was, be totally frank and honest about it. Uh, a lot of those people are going to say, come on now, Garnet, you're having a midlife crisis. This is what happens to people. They think they've been abducted by aliens. They think they've been taken over by spirits. This is just what's happened to you. No, absolutely. And, and, and uh, I, I did lose a lot of uh, friends along the way. Nobody actually said that to my face, uh, Howard, but I knew they were <laughs> thinking that uh, because they just sort of shunned me, didn't talk to me, didn't say anything. But there was a number of them actually who were quite good. They actually sent me a, an email to say, uh, you know, good for you. You had the courage to, uh, to come out and write this book. And uh, thank you very much. I enjoyed it. So it was a bit of a mixed bag. I lost some. I won a lot of new friends along the way. And, uh, you know, I knew it was going to happen, Howard, and that's just part of life. Mm. Well, in a very different context, I've had a couple of friends that I've worked with uh, who've decided to change gender because that's the way that they, they were born. You know, they were born in the wrong gender and they were working in hard working environments. And the way that it's tended to work is that you think you're going to get a hostile reaction from people and actually the good people come along with you on your journey. Yes, absolutely. Now, that's what I found out. And, and, and for the people who, who thought that I was losing my mind, well, they're entitled to their opinion. And I know that what I'm doing is, is I'm on the right path. And eventually, whether they believe it now or they wait until after they die and cross over, eventually they'll find out the truth themselves. Was there anything that could have led up to the experience that you had? In other words, were your thought processes beginning to go that way? Had you yourself had some bereavements? Often they can be tipping points in people's lives. Uh, were you going through some kind of crisis? Was there anything that could have made something like that happen? Precipitated it, I think. No, not, absolutely nothing hard, which is unusual because there was there was none of that. Uh, I had I was in the middle of a crisis. hadn't just recently lost anyone in my family. My parents passed away years before, um, and so it was uh, it just sort of totally came out of the blue. Um, and, I, and I think it was just in response to um, all the questions I've been asking myself all you know through my later years in life. And um, no doubt the timing was planned beforehand, but I wasn't aware of it, Howard. So, but but uh, you'd already started, as you told me, you started asking those questions. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I was trying to find the answers. And I, I did read a lot of books on religion and spirituality. Uh, there were pieces here and there that seemed to make sense, but nobody had the whole picture fit together for me until Albert came along. And then it all just sort of flowed. And there it was. He laid it out before me. It just made great sense to me then. And, the and, most I, and I found my answers. Fascinating part of your story is that. But it is also the, the hardest one to explain to people and the, the most difficult one to justify, isn't it? Because it's one thing to say, this I believe, but it's another thing to say, this I actually saw and three-dimensionally experienced. You know, you were, what, going about your business one day and there is somebody who turns out to be not a regular person. Yeah, I was just strolling down the street one day in, in 2007 and all of a sudden this homeless man jumps out in front of me. Um, and uh, sort of stops him in my tracks. And he looked like a typ typical homeless man, except he had these amazing, dazzling blue eyes. And they were penetrating deep within me, right down to the depths of my soul. And I felt like he knew everything about me, even though we'd never met. Um, and at the same time, his eyes were sending this warm gush of pure, unconditional love to me that was just infusing my body with an amazing sense of peace and security. So I knew he was different. Well, that, and, that uh, sounds to a lot of people, will sound to a lot of people, almost like uh, that. You, did you see that movie Bruce Almighty with Morgan Freeman, who appeared as God? I didn't see the movie, no. Okay, well, I mean, in a different way, he wasn't uh, a tramp or a hobo, a homeless man, anything like that. Uh, but uh, a man in a white suit, who was Morgan Freeman with piercing eyes, turned up and uh, introduced himself to God and decided to give the star of the movie uh, his powers for a while. Uh, some people will see parallels in that. It sounds like you had a real life experience, uh, something like that. It was, it was a real life transformational experience for sure. Unfortunately, Albert didn't give me any of his powers. I would have loved to have, have that for a while, but he was just there 
to answer my questions, to, to mm. give me some revelations. And, to, and, and then, of course, he, he said my mission was to write books about what he told me, what he showed me. And so that's my new path is uh, being an author and uh, sort of following his marching orders. Mm. And I think we've got to talk in some detail about the conversation. I mean, how do you have a conversation like that? If I was to be walking around here and somebody jumps out in front of me, well, first of all, I'm wondering, we're wondering if they're going to mug me because this is London and that's how it is. Uh, and then it's very hard to get into conversations. It's maybe easier where you are, but it's, it's hard to get into conversations with people, isn't it? And especially where they start divulging things. Usually, even though you know, I'm the kind of people, the person people talk to, but usually people don't. No, that's you're very true. And, and and typically when I met homeless people on the street before, I just do a quick sidestep and go around them. But because of his amazing, dazzling eyes, I just stood there like a deer caught in the headlights and uh in, in enjoying the bask from his uh, from his gaze. Um and uh so that that's what really set him apart. And so I was skeptical a bit at first because because I'm a lawyer my and, and how lawyers are very analytical. And when he said he was here to help me and I said to him, well, how can you help me when you can't even help yourself? Mm. Because you've been sleeping in the street for weeks and you smell like a dead fish. Well, um, well, no, exactly. I mean, very good questions. And that's your legal training coming out there. This person was three dimensional, real, touchable, if you'd want to, uh, feelable, absolutely there in front of you. And what did he just announce, Albert? You know, I'm here to help you. Did he just come out with it straight away or did you talk before that? No, in my first encounter, uh, I was just standing there like a, a caught in, a, in a, a time warp almost. And then he broke the spell by saying, why are you here? And then he quickly disappeared into a nearby store. When I went to find him, he wasn't there. And I watched, searched the street up and down. He wasn't there. I came back the very next day determined to find him. The same time, same street. And eventually I found him sitting alone on a bench. And uh, so then I went up to him and I said, you know, why did you stop me? He said, well, I'm a soul just like you. I'm here to help you on your journey and answer your questions. And so then that was the uh, beginning of the of a dialogue. He was there physically. He was, I touched him. He was, you know, flesh and bones. Um, but, but I found out afterwards that um, I was the only one who ac could actually see him in the physical form. That is where you may depart uh, from people who like to be rational about these things. They may say, well, clearly, if you couldn't see him, that's in your mind. No, I could see him for sure, but nobody else could. So I could see him and touch him and feel him, but he said nobody else could. And of course, I didn't realize it at the time because I, I wasn't asking other people who were walking by if they could see this man. I just assumed they could. But he told me later that they could not, only I could see him. And after the first three visits uh, that we had, he then no longer showed up in physical form. He was just a voice in my head and we communicated by telepathy. So that's how most of our dialogue carried on after that. Do you have a family? Yes, I do. I have a wife and I have... Uh, Two sons, two daughters-in-law, and one grandchild. Tell me about the process of revealing this to them. Well, I didn't reveal it to anyone at first for the longest time, not even my wife, because I was afraid of what her reaction might be. She might think that I was becoming senile early, early on in my years. And uh, Well, all so sorts of things. I mean, all sorts of uh, conclusions people might come to. I suppose you would think all kinds of, I mean, you wouldn't know what to think. You'd think schizophrenia, all kinds of things. Oh, absolutely. Um, so it, it took me a long time before I sort of slowly leaked out to my wife my experience. She was actually very good because she's a very spiritual person. She actually had encou encounters with her deceased father and mother shortly after they both passed away. So she was uh, very familiar with this. So when I said, guess what, I was, had a conversation with my spirit guide. She was like, yeah, okay. And uh, yeah, go ahead, write your book. And I'm, I'm right behind you. Wow. So that was good. And so that was beautiful. And then mm. I gradually let my sons know, and they didn't say much, but they encouraged me. Uh, and uh, so I, I, I uh, became emboldened by that and slowly let other people know. But when I was... And, and your sons, let, let's talk about your sons. I mean, I, uh, you know, a lot of young guys, uh, you know, they like football. Uh, they enjoy beer and the company of young ladies. Uh, you, you come out with something like that to them and they'll say, Dad, um, are you Okay. Yeah, actually, I was expecting that reaction, but uh, they were very good about it. Now, maybe they were thinking that, Howard, but they didn't say it to me. Mm -hmm. uh, but generally, they were quite uh, quite supportive. I mean, they didn't. We didn't get into a lot of discussions. They didn't ask me a lot of questions about it. Um, I think they've they've read my books, and we haven't talked about it. So, uh, I, I think they're okay. They may not be hundred percent on board, but I think that they're uh, they they realize that I'm not crazy and that I'm. Uh, 
uh, I'm on a mission to, to, to write books and they're, they're, they're good for that. They're, they're happy. So for them and your wife, who sounds incredibly understanding and, and how great for you that she's a spiritual person and could embrace such things. Um, how about you? Do, do you feel that you changed? Oh, absolutely. Like I'm, I'm, I'm almost a totally different person from when, from before I met Albert, because that before I was a straight laced, button down, stuff shirt, corporate lawyer. Uh, and I never talked about spirituality or religion or anything else. Um, and all of a sudden now I'm on a totally different path. Uh, and so, and it's, it's a much better path for me. I, I much more enjoy being an author and, and dealing with Albert than practicing law. I can tell you that for sure. Uh, so it's, it's, it's very much transformational. I look at people in a much different light. Um, and I'm, uh, a lot, I have a lot more compassion for other people and other creatures on our planet. And the chronology of this, uh, you met Albert in 2007, but you didn't retire until 2008. So did the appearance of Albert prompt your retirement? And if if it did, what was the process of uh, communicating this to your employers and deciding to take retirement and follow a different path? What was that like, if, if I'm right with that chronology? Oh, yeah, there's no doubt that, that meeting Albert really put me on the path towards retirement. I'd been thinking about it sort of uh, in, you know, off and on about retiring. But when Albert came along, all of a sudden, and there it was, and I realized that practicing law was not the place I should be. And I needed to get out so I could write a, a, a book about Albert's revelations. And it took me a while to sort of get my mind organized. And it was about a year later that I actually did retire. When I retired, I just told my law partners, um, you know, I'm tired of practicing law, and so I'm going to. I'm going to retire. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to move on. So this other work that you're doing now uh, and the, the writing and the disclosure that you're doing would have come as a surprise to them. They wouldn't have known about that at the time you retired and in the run up to you leaving. That's absolutely right. No, I did not mention anything about Albert before uh, I retired. So they just think I was just retiring in a normal course. Why didn't you tell them? I was still concerned about what they might say. And I wasn't, I hadn't, I still hadn't come in, in my mind. I still hadn't come to the conclusion that I was going to come out of the spiritual closet yet. I was still struggling with that. And I didn't want to, uh, I didn't want to tell them. I wanted to leave sort of on, on the note that I'm just uh, retiring in a normal course. You sound and, very, uh, very calm and very happy about it all. Oh, um, absolutely. And uh, it, it was, it was a bit of a struggle to decide to, to do it. But now that I've done it, I'm just very happy with it. And did you ever feel in the early stages that, as I might feel if something like that happened to me, just to be sure about all of this, because you know, I'm very open to all kinds of things, and you know, I, I believe that such things may well happen. But even if I did believe that such things may well happen, and if I'd experienced one, part of me might think, well, I, maybe just to be totally sure, I'd better go to the doctor and have myself checked out, just in case there's something else going on. No, that never occurred to me, Howard. I always felt that um, my my discussions with Albert were real. Uh, it wasn't a hallucination. I wasn't dreaming. It was very real to me. What he told me really rang true to me, and I had no doubts whatsoever that I wasn't uh, that that I was sane and I, I wasn't concerned that I was losing my mind. Never occurred to me at all, Howard. I was very confident about where I was going. And if Albert had wanted to help you, but that maybe he did. Um, could he not have made his presence known to those people around you so that they could have been as convinced of his existence as you were? Oh, he certainly could have, but he chose not to. I mean, he he, he, he tends not to try to make my life any easier than it should be. Like he's told me, he doesn't give me personal advice about how to solve problems in my personal life. He says, You're, that's for you to figure out. I'm here to give you revelations for you to write about. And so I'm not going to make your life any easier. And so he, he could have appeared to them. He chose not to. He knew that would be part of my struggle that I had to go through personally, an experience I needed to have uh, to, uh, you know, to break out on my own and try to convince people around me that uh, what I saw was was real so when he started revealing things to you how did that begin what did he start by telling you well in answer to my first question who am i he said well you're you're an eternal soul like everyone else and you'll live forever and that you came to this planet you incarnated by your own choice it wasn't because god or the source put you here or anyone else you came here to learn and experience things so the life you're living is the life that you chose for yourself you may not realize now or remember why you chose it, but you did choose it. And, and so you're here to learn and experience things. So that was sort of like the first big question. Who am I? Why am I here? I'm here to learn and experience things in a life that I planned for myself before I was born. So and did he tell you at any point that that experience was common to everybody? Or did you think that it was, it was just for you? 
Oh no, everyone, everyone here incarnates for that purpose, but we all have a different purpose because we all are different. We've all had different journeys, different incarnations. So we need different things when we arrive on earth and we all have different life plans. You know, like in your life plan, you chose where you're going to be born, the first language you would learn, the identity of your parents and siblings and friends and so on. And of course, my choices are much different than yours because we're all on a different path. But everyone here is on a, pla- a path that they pre-planned before they were born. And did you ask him at an early stage, you know, why he didn't bother coming up to anybody else and telling them this? Why have you done this with me? Uh, yeah, he did. I asked him a question. He said, uh, because we, we thought that perhaps you might be a good messenger for us. Uh, and he has many messengers on earth, many he channels through many different people. He thought that I might be a good one because I had in, 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 in some of my previous lives, I had some experience in writing. So they thought I might be a good candidate to write some books. And so that's why he chose me. This was planned all beforehand, before I was born, between him and I. I didn't remember any of it, but of course it was all carefully planned out. And so he came sort of at the right time in my life to uh, allow me to move off the legal path and onto uh, his path. And so it was perfect timing. And who deputed him to come to you? In other words, who gave him his orders? Who's his boss? Well, there's there's a, 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 a council. Council of Wise Ones uh, is a body of very wise souls on, on the spirit side, and they oversee all incarnations on Earth. And so they were they were the ones who were sort of orchestrating Albert to get me involved and a bunch of other people. So they're sort of in charge of all this, and they they channel through many different people. And Albert was one of their uh, disciples, basically, and 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 he chose me among other people. And there you are taking these revelations home to, well, I, you told the wife by this time, presumably, you're taking these revelations home to her. Uh, how's that going down with her? Oh, good. I mean, she, she, she agrees with everything. She, I mean, in her heart, she already knew that, that all these things were true. So it was really nothing new to her. But, but, but she, you know, here it was I, was, I just laid it out in front of her in my book. And, and she's agreed with everything. She, she doesn't dispute anything. Um, she, she actually wasn't raised as a Catholic, but converted to, to uh, my religion when we got married. Um, but, you know, she's abandoned it as, just as I have. And she, uh, she's fully signed on to what Albert says. Did you at any point acquaint your uh, your uh, priest with uh, with this did you try and talk to your prison if you were still going to church uh, going to to mass and what have you did you tell the church about this yeah, no, I had stopped going to mass uh, quite a quite a few years before that, so there was nobody that I could contact, and I I probably wouldn't have anyway because I mean priests are priests and they uh, they're, they're trained to uh, stick to the dogma of the church, and uh, so it would would have been like talking to uh, somebody who who's who is deaf because they wouldn't have listened to any of it and they would have disagreed with me because a lot of things in my book, as you know, uh, Howard, um, uh, fly in the face of what the Christian Church has been preaching for centuries, and so it, it's not something that that, that anybody who's in practice and Catholic can easily sign on to. And did you ever worry, if you didn't worry that there was something mental going on, did you ever worry that perhaps something was possessing you, perhaps something that was undesirable? No, because everything that Albert, uh, his presence, his voice in my head was all very, uh, very pleasant, uh, very, give, give me a lot of confidence and, and a great feeling of well-being. There was never any distress. I was never, ever concerned about my welfare or that Albert might be a, an evil spirit. Because I, But if you could listen to him, you'd know what I mean. He, he was a very kind and wise and compassionate soul. And I felt very comfortable with him. Is he Canadian? <laughs> he, he, we didn't discuss that. He, uh, how does he sound? Well, well, he he sounds uh, uh, he sounds just like you and I. I mean, I, he didn't really have any accent. Uh, I suppose his accent was closer to being a Canadian than anything. Um, but uh, he, you know, he he. Uh, He's had many lives on earth before himself. He and I have had a number of other lives, you know, one in England in particular. Um, but, you know, those people, they can take on any accent and speak any language that they want to. So his voice just came through. I didn't even think about whether he had an accent or where he might be from. In a previous life, you'd known him. Was he a member of your family? Was he close to you? Um, yes, he was uh, in, in one life in, in Ireland. He was, uh, he was actually my father. Uh, he was a potato farmer and and actually died at an early age. Um, in another life in uh, in um, medieval England, he was a minor lord, and I was his manservant. 
and he ended up uh, having a tragic accident, falling off his horse, was confined to his bed for a good part of his life. And uh, we had a lot of very deep conversations. So those are a couple that he let on. Uh, there may be others, but he, he, he wasn't the kind of guy to sort of let me dwell and ask questions about all my other lifetimes because he said, we have things to do and business to attend to. So he always had an agenda for me and he didn't let me sort of lollygag and ask uh, questions just out of pure curiosity. I love the word, that's a real Canadian word, lollygag. Uh, thank you for reminding me of it. Uh, did you feel that you wanted to research those past lives so that you could verify it? Because if you did research the past lives, there you got the proof. This really happened. Yeah, I, I, I did want that. But, you know, Albert was crafty enough not to give me enough details that I could actually research it. He was very general. Um, so that uh, because he knew, of course, that I would just spend a lot of time doing some research and trying to verify it. And he didn't want me to waste the time. So he didn't give me enough details to get me there. He was very general about where I was and exactly, in it, and it, he didn't give me any last names. So it was pretty tough for me to sort of follow up. I wished I could have, but I, but he wouldn't give me those details. I've got listeners screaming at their MP3 players and mobile devices right now. That's very convenient. Uh, well, that he didn't give you the detail. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, no, he did that very deliberately because he didn't want me to go ahead and do some research and try to... Prove. But it also means it, it renders it not provable. Oh, yeah, no, it's not provable. Well, I mean, you know, people can either believe me, Howard, or they can not, and it's up to them to uh, their choice. And I'm not concerned about the people who say that's just a convenient story. You didn't have any details. Um, you know, that's uh, th that's just the way it is. And I can't change that. Albert won't give me details. He didn't, even though I asked him for it. And uh, that's just the way it is. And if they think that's just a convenient story, that's entirely up to them to believe that, Howard. Does he still talk to you? Yes, he does. Is he talking to you now? Uh, no, he doesn't talk to me when I'm on the radio show. He, he, we don't talk daily. We talk occasionally here and there. Um, the, you know, after our first set of conversations, as you may know, uh, I, I, I had a, a different set of encounters with him, which was a series of astral adventures with him. Um, and, and that's detailed in my second book, Dancing Forever with Spirit. Um, and so, and, and that's that rather than just have a, a straight dialogue, Albert actually took me on astral trips to the spirit side and to other planets and various other places where I could see things to write about in my book, which I did. So that was his way of uh, getting me into the second set of, of, uh, of revelations that he, uh, that he gave to me um, in, uh, through, through astral traveling. So, um, and, and those, those uh, adventures sort of went on for oh, three or four months. And then, I would, then he would sort of disappear for a while and I'd write about what I had seen. And there was actually a, a, another set of astral adventures I had uh, recently which I detailed in my third book, Dance of Heavenly Bliss. Hmm. So I've had, I've now finished three books. Uh, the third one will be published sometime early next year. All right. Uh, Astral Adventures. This, I'm getting pictures in my head of, I'm enchanted by that Christmas cartoon. I'm, I'm wondering if they show it in Canada. Uh, the Snowman, where this snowman takes a little boy, grabs him by the hand and whisks him into the air on Christmas Eve and takes him on an adventure. And he sees so many different things. Was it like that? Was it like being taken by the hand and whisked into another dimension? Um, yeah, it literally was. I mean, how it happened was that he uh, he appeared in my bedroom one night. I was asleep. I sat up because I heard a noise and I saw this ghost-like ethereal figure standing in the doorway of my bedroom. And when it moved closer, I saw, well, it's Albert in his homeless man disguise, except he was in astral form. And he literally, he said he's taking me on a series of astral trips. He literally reached out and, and pulled uh, my astral body out of my physical body. And away we went, up through the ceiling, up to the clouds, and, and hovered it, uh, at a high spot way above our beautiful planet. So it was really, that was really the start of it. And from there, we went to the spirit side and we met with the Council of Wise Ones. And he took me to a, a few other planets. And uh, it was an amazing set of, of adventures. Well, you're skipping uh, through an awful lot of stuff very quickly. What was it like to meet the Council of Wise Ones? I mean, that's, you're meeting the government there. Yes. Well, they were, it was quite amazing. It was in a, a building that he called the Hall of Wisdom. And they were sitting in this big uh, uh, chamber with a high dome ceiling. And there were 11 souls sitting around a, a U-shaped or horseshoe-shaped table. Um, and they were all, uh, they all had snow white hair, smooth, unwrinkled skin. And they wore gold robes with white sashes. And um, the, the chair of the, of the council, Sophia, uh, was the one who spoke to me. And Albert explained, as, as I mentioned before, the council oversees all the incarnations on earth now they live on the spirit side so they're in the spiritual realm uh, but they had asked albert to take me there because they had a message for me to take back to our, to my fellow humans and so that's why i met with them 
What was the message? The message was, hey, guys, you know, humans, you, you're at, at a very advanced stage of development. You have advanced technology, but your spiritual and emotional intelligence has not kept up. And that means that you let your negative emotions like fear, anger, hate, and greed get out of control. And that leads to violence and, uh, and conflicts. And they said, we really have to focus because we're at a crucial inflection point. And, and we're at a point where, you know, the next step could be we destroy all life on the planet with our weapons of mass destruction, or we move on from that, move up the spiritual ladder, uh, raise our vibrations and try to... Uh, continue with our journey up the vibrational ladder to get to the ultimately to the new earth. And when you asked them, when they asked you to take this message back here, did you say to them, as, as I would be inclined if I was conscious up there and encountering them, I, did you think of saying, I'm one small guy, this is a big message to take back there. What kind of help are you going to give me to get this message across? Well, they they, uh, they lined up Albert to, to take me to various places so that I could actually see with my own eyes what it was he wanted to show us and so that I could write about it. But the other help that they're giving me, I mean, basically they say, I'm just one, of, one messenger of many, many, many that they have. And there's other people all over the world that channel their message. You know, people who have, like yourself with radio shows, people who write books and blogs, uh, uh, people who speak at, at public engagements. So there's many, many of us who are all giving the message. And so the, the help that I have is, is, uh, is Albert's guidance um, to help me write my books. And then from there, it's up to the people of the world to read my books and to listen to your show, Howard, and to ho hopefully, uh, if enough people are sending the message, there'll be enough people who actually listen to it and accept it. So if I'm being used in this process, and sometimes I think maybe I am being used in some kind of process, but I don't quite understand by what or for what, uh, I haven't had the experience of encountering them, but some people get introduced to Albert or something like Albert, and some people, uh, like the messengers, don't. Is that the way that it works? Some people are given a clear steer and other people are just given the task and get on with it and they feel impelled to do something, but they don't know why. No, exactly. It is, it, it, it's, it's both ways. Some people have direct contact, but most of the time people are channeling spirit without necessarily realizing that they are. And, and, and um, you know, the, the, the messages from spirit can be very subtle, um, but uh, so... Sometimes when you're when you think that you've got a, a brilliant flash of intuition, a great idea that just popped into your mind, a lot of the times that has come from your guides or from spirit, even though you think it's your own idea. And so that happens all the time. So there's so many there's a whole lot more people who are channeling spirit who don't necessarily realize it, but they are spreading the message. And that's all that spirit wants. And, and uh, the, the, you know, that's their whole game plan is to have more and more people spread the message of love and compassion. And so. You may not have met your spirit guide, Howard, but for sure you are spreading the message. I've picked a few paragraphs out of your book, uh, one of your books here, and uh, I'm going to read them to you because they make nice reading. So if you're, if you're happy for me to do this, I'm going to pick this one first. Um, and I'll quote, If you were in school and studying weather, you'd learn that the air temperature in parts of the Northern Hemisphere would drop down to minus 20 during the winter months, which could result in frostbite or death to an unprotected human body. Even with all this knowledge about sub-zero temperatures, however, you would still not fully appreciate such cold and its effects on a human body. Your knowledge would not be complete, and you wouldn't have a full understanding of these temperatures unless you travelled to Alaska or Siberia in the middle of January and stood outside with nothing on. Um, that's a, that's an interesting paragraph. What does it mean? Well, it, it, he's basically trying to explain to me why I, as a soul residing on a spirit side, why I want to choose to incarnate on Earth. And he said because there are things that happen on Earth, like negative emotions that don't exist on the spirit side. So I can I can study about what happens on Earth, but that's like book learning. And so to really fully understand uh, negative emotions and other things that happen on Earth, I have to actually come here in a physical form and experience it firsthand. And so that was his example is that, the, you know, you could you could learn about uh, minus 20 degree temperatures, but you don't really know uh, what it's like until you actually experience it, you know, uh, in, in, a, in a physical environment. And so that was his way of explaining why we come here. Okay, so I can get a computer game that simulates what it's like to fly a fighter jet. And I can be pretty good at that on the simulator on my computer, but that's not flying a fighter jet. Exactly. And that's exactly the point he was trying to make. And that's, and that's why souls come here. I mean, it, 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 
an incarnation on earth is not a walk in the park. It's a tough school. And so if you ask yourself, why would I choose to come here? It's because when you're on the other side, you have a very good reason. You really want to experience life on earth in the physical form, experience it firsthand. That's assuming that you've never experienced it before. Well, no, even if you have, because a lot of us have previous lives, but there's always something different to experience on earth. I mean, you know, in, in one life you might have experienced, uh, uh, you know, love and compassion. Uh, in another life you might have experienced being the, uh, the object of hate and discrimination. Uh, but but there's, there, there's nuances, there's different, there's, there's different uh, uh, emotions that you can experience that you don't necessarily experience in any given life. So there's a whole range of things that you can experience on this earth and lessons to be learned. And that's why people keep on coming back and back and back. Were you ever tempted because you are a questioning person? We all are to an extent, different extents, uh, to ask Albert when and how you would die? Oh, yes, I, I did ask him. And he said, uh, yeah, I know, but I'm not going to tell you because that would not, uh, that would be, uh, that would really change your journey. I mean, and, and for the most part, I asked him, but I was really almost hoping that he wouldn't tell me because, uh, you know, nobody really wants to know the exact date. He did say that, that my soul uh, will choose when it's time for me to exit. And that, that's true with everyone's soul. No one dies by accident. So even if 300 people die in a plane crash, it was because the souls of all of those people decided to exit at that time. So there's no death by accident. We die when our souls want to leave. That's but he wouldn't tell very, me when I was when I was going to leave. That's a very heavy thought. Um, here's another quote: "All souls are eager to learn more about themselves and the universe, so that they can evolve and grow. Earth has a diversity of physical conditions and negative emotions that souls desire to experience to advance their evolution. These harsh conditions provide souls the opportunity to appreciate more fully the unconditional love and happiness they enjoy on the spirit side. In other words, go down there." see how bad it can be, then you'll know how nice it is up here. Exactly. Yeah, as some people say you, you can't truly know the light until you've experienced the darkness. And that's exactly one of the reasons that we come here, to learn and experience things. And you really do fully appreciate how nice it is over there after you spend a lifetime here, because even a relatively good lifetime on Earth is, is, uh, is quite a bit uh, harsher than what you would experience on the, on the spirit side. But if they keep sending people back... Uh, to try and improve and improve the lot of people down here, then look, I've known some wonderful, generous, decent, helpful people. I have also known and worked for and with and experienced in my life some of the vilest human beings you could ever come across. And, you know, they've caused me and other people untold hurt. If there is constant improvement and souls are being sent back here to try and improve things, why is that stuff still going on? Well, it's because they haven't quite, uh, the message hasn't quite gotten to everyone yet. And there's still too many people who can't control their negative emotions. Now, we have improved. I mean, compared to, say, the, the Middle Ages, we're, we are a lot better a, as a whole than we were back 500 years ago. But we still have a long ways to go. And so, uh, you know, that's just the, the, the way it is. When, when evil stuff happens on Earth, it's either because it was actually pre-planned before that soul was born, or it's because somebody just lost control of their negative emotions because we have free will to act and our free will can take us anywhere. It can take us to the good side or it can take us to the dark side and it's up to us. And so there's still too many people who are uh, letting negative emotions rule their lives and control what they do. And, and it's, it's gotten better, as I say, but we have, we have a ways to go yet. And have you ever wondered, uh, have you ever asked Albert, uh, you know, why, what would, what would make somebody want to destroy the Twin Towers and take away, I think the figure was three and a half thousand in the end, uh, lives? What's, what's that for and, and how could that be allowed to happen? Well, first of all, um, what happens on Earth just happens. Like the, the God or the source doesn't control or, or manipulate things on Earth, contrary to what a lot of religions say. So there's not God up there, you know, w w pulling strings on a, on a puppet and making things happen or not happen. So it's really uh, humans here who are uh, trying to follow their own path. And sometimes they lose control of their negative emotions. So a lot of the evil is just people who uh, go straying way off the path they had planned and they end up doing awful things like murders and uh, and um, uh, genocide and, you know, crashing into the Twin Towers. So on uh, this side of life, our natural condition is good and we can choose to deviate from it. We can be weak and deviate from what is our natural programming and that is to do and be good. Um, yes, that, that often happens. Although sometimes some of the evil acts on Earth are actually planned beforehand. 
So this may seem strange to you, but if, for example, if I decide that I want to incarnate and I want to experience what it's like to be physically abused by my father, then before I'm born, I have to enlist another soul who will be my father and, and agree, have that soul agree to give me abuse on earth because that's something I want to experience. So that may seem very strange, but that does happen. So two causes for evil, somebody going straying off their path or somebody following the path they had planned beforehand. God, it's it really hard to compute that somebody might choose to be murdered. It is because we don't understand it. We're, we're looking at it from a human perspective, Howard. But on the other side, it's just like being in a play. I mean, life is sort of like, I mean, if you're an actor and, and somebody wants you to act in a play where, uh, where you're, you're stabbed to death, I mean, you'll say, okay, fine, that's an experience and, and, and it doesn't really matter anyway. It's just a play. And so souls on the spirit side look at life on earth like a play. So, you know, if, 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 you, uh, if, you get, if, if you become murdered or if you are a murderer, uh, that's just all part of a script that, uh, that you may have planned beforehand. When you get back to the spirit side, it's like when the curtain goes down on a play, it's like, okay, you and the person who murdered you are just best of buddies like you were before. There's, there's no carryover, no hangover of anger or, or uh, animosity. It's, uh, you know, life on earth is very much like a play. And we don't understand that here now, but when we're on the, on the other side, on the spirit side, it makes eminent good sense to us. I've had many people in a variety of different disciplines try to tell me things along the lines of this life that you're living is a bit of an illusion. It's not really real. And you can project into it things that you want to happen and you can you can change the course of it because actually it isn't really what you think it is. It's not as three dimensional as all that. Do you go along with that? Um. Yes, to some degree, but I, but I think though that for most of us, the Earth schools seems to be very real. And when you're on the spirit side, of course, the, the fact that life on Earth is like an illusion is, seems to be very real. I mean, it's just there for as a school, um, and it's on the denser plane, and it and it, it for them the, the things are just sort of a you know a play acting, a, an illusion, if you will. Uh, for us here, when we're living on Earth, of course, that doesn't uh, seem to be very true. But in any event, ho however you characterize it, it it's a it's a, a learning school, a place for us to to to, to experience things and to learn lessons um, and to try to evolve as souls. Uh, so you know you can call it an illusion, you can call it reality. When we're here, it seems like a lot like reality. Like Albert Einstein said. Life on Earth is an illusion, albeit a very persistent illusion. Those people you worked with in the corporate world, you said you've kept some of the friends that you had there. When you talk to them, do they go there with you? Do they talk with you about this or do you talk about anything but this? We tend to talk anything but uh, about my spiritual awakening. So we sort of will talk about uh, uh, sports. We'll talk about world politics. We'll talk about uh, the finance world. We tend to avoid talking. I, I won't raise it unless they do. Sometimes they might ask me a question about when my book, next book is coming out, but we don't really get into it in depth. That's generally the rule. And so I'm not quite sure whether they're not comfortable talking about it or whether they don't really quite believe it and they just want to sort of ignore it and carry on like we were before. So do you suspect that some of them might think, uh, God, a nice man, good colleague for all of those years, want to stay in touch with him, but God knows what's happened to him? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm certain some of them have, and uh, I can just tell by the, the way they talk to me and the way they, some of them won't even mention anything about my books or, 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 or ask me questions. And I just know they're sort of thinking, hmm, I wonder if Old Garnet has, uh, is suffering from senility. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and I'm fine with that, but I... Uh, you you I don't sound that. senile at all. How old are you, Garnet? I'm 64. Okay, well, you're a bit young for senile. <laughs> I don't I think you're so. there. <laughs> I certainly hope so. Now, look, because of this regular contact with Albert, if I was in regular contact with Albert, I would want to ask him a whole raft of questions, um, you know, really significant questions and things like, what are the six numbers in the bonus ball for this week's national lottery in the UK? <laughs> yes, and I tried to ask him that. And he, you know, I mean, the obvious thing is, you know, give, give me the winning lottery number. And he said, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to help you or change anything personally in your life. That's not why I'm here. Um, and uh, if I did give you the winning lottery number, I would send you way off the path you had intended. And you would, you, you would uh, you know, g give me heck when you got back on the spirit side for changing your life uh, in an unintentional way. So he's not going to do that. But you've been very compliant in all of this, Garnet. If it was me, I, I think a part of me, because I'm a contrary soul like that. And I'm a nice man, but, you know, every so often I'll rebel. I think I might well have said to him by now, look, 
I'm walking this path for you. I'm, I'm digging the trench. I'm doing it. It's hard work. I want one thing from you that positively, absolutely, totally proves that all of this is true and it's not just in my head. Give me one nugget, something I couldn't have known, something I can take somewhere that can be verified just once and then I'll go away happy. Yes, I have asked him that and he said, be patient. Um, I, I will give that to you when the time is right. It's not right yet. And so I have to go with that. So I, I'm hoping at some point I'll get that. But he's saying, I'm not going to give that to you now. He has a very much of a controlled agenda for me. And he knows when I should be uh, learning things. And he doesn't always answer all my questions. A lot, some questions he just said, you don't need to know that now. So I have to just go with that. Well, it's so all on a need to know basis. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's his view. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I don't need to know things and he will not tell me. And again, if it was me, but then I am a contrary and I'd have, I'd have been asking him every fortnight. Once a fortnight, regular as clockwork. Is it time for me to know the big thing yet? Yeah, I tend to not uh, be that <laughs> persistent, uh, Howard. But, uh, uh, you know, I just have to go with it because I and I don't really want to annoy him. Um, so I, I, I tend not to, to bother him too much about it. But he has told me at some point um, I'm going to uh, he's going to reveal the big one to me. Don't know what it is. He won't tell me. So I'm just waiting. And that's, that's sort of one of the things that makes my life really interesting. Like, when is it coming? Hmm. But by the sounds of it, mankind is ongoing. We're not going to destroy ourselves. He's, he's very optimistic that we won't. And because of all the help we're getting from, uh, from the, the spirit realm, and uh, there's a lot of uh, you know, very advanced souls among us right now. They're all trying to help us by spreading the word. Uh, he's confident that we can get over the hump and, uh, and, and avoid destroying ourselves. And, uh, and of course, there's been a, a lot of other civilizations that have destroyed ourselves themselves in the past, like Lemuria and Atlantis. Uh, and they're really trying to stop us from uh, having the same uh, same result. So, uh, but he's confident we can overcome it. We just have to really dig down and work at it. What about all of these people that I've come across all over the world, uh, both hemispheres and all around the world, who believe, and these are often very respectable professional people, believe that they're so-called light workers and they're doing good work together by focusing their energies to try and stop the negativity and destruction here. Are, are you part of that movement? Um, Albert has never given me that label, but I expect that I am. I mean, he's always referred to me as one of his messengers. But I think what you're talking about, the light workers, they're very much in a similar vein. They're, they're here to try to help uh, their fellow humans to, to, to get over, to overcome this, uh, this uh, crunch point that we're at and to help us, uh, you know, control, control our negative emotions and embrace love and compassion. So I think that uh, that term can apply to a lot of people, it can apply to you, Howard, uh, whether, whether or not you, uh, you like the label or not, I, I think you probably are. Well, it's an, I've been told that before, you know, and who knows? I'm, I'm not sure. My jury's out, but uh, at least there must be hope for me because I'm willing to be persuaded. Here's another quote from the book, one of the books. Everything in your life is not predetermined. Your life plan is a broad outline of your life that is subject to change as a result of the decisions you make and your reaction to events. You have the right to exercise your free will on Earth, and this affects how you live within the broad blueprint of your life plan. When you're on the spirit side, you can't accurately predict how you as an incarnate soul will exercise your free will through conscious decisions and actions. Life on your planet is a way for souls to learn and evolve without any concern about retribution or punishment. Murderers don't go to the spirit side as a reward for crimes. They go to the spirit side because there is no other place to go. Uh, that's uh, big stuff. Yes, and, and, and it's actually very true. Hard for us to uh, really comprehend fully what, what Albert told me, but basically uh, we, it, that's why we're in such a tough school because we're here, we have free will to take actions, but we don't remember what we intended in our pre-birth planning. So we kind of have to struggle our way through. Uh, we do get guidance from our spirit guides, but that guidance is usually very subtle. It's like flashes of intuition and whispers in our minds. And all too often we don't hear it, or if we do, we don't pay any attention to it. And that's why it's, 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 uh, it's really a struggle to be a, a human on our planet. And, um, and all too often we go way off course from what we intended. But it doesn't really matter because at the end of the day, even if you screwed up terribly, you still go back to the spirit side because there is no hell, there is no punishment, and there's nowhere else to go but back to the spirit side. Okay, so whether we want to or not, we're going to go there. And actually, when we get there, we're going to quite like being there. Oh, absolutely. It, it's a wonderful place. There's no negative emotions. We don't have physical bodies. I mean, it's just a, it's basically like the heaven that a lot of religions have described to us. 
Um, and uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's just a great place. It's really a, truly our home. That's where we really reside. Um, and these little excursions to Earth are just little side adventures to help us in our evolution. Um, and so, but but the, the other part of what uh, that quote says is that, uh, and a lot of people have a hard time accepting this, is that the bad guys go to heaven as well. Um, which is hard for a lot of people to accept, but that's just what happens. And as I say, if, if you're murdered here on earth, when you get back to the spirit side, you, you still unconditionally love the person who did the, 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 the evil deed to you on earth, which is also hard for people to, to accept. Well, of course, they, that is hard for people to accept because you, you hear of the disgusting crimes, you know, the people who murder other people quite brutally and the, the child abusers and all the rest of it. And, it, you know, it makes your blood boil and your flesh creep. And you wonder what can motivate somebody to do things like that. Yeah, and, and most of the time, as I said, it's it's just uh, people losing control of their negative emotions. Their free will runs amok, and they just head way off course, and they do really horrible things. Uh, and uh, so, there's a know, part of us in our free will that wants to do bad. Oh yes, there, there's there's the dark side of humanity that's always there, and it's always trying to get out and to, to control what we do. And uh, there's always a constant struggle between the dark side and the good side of, of humanity. And some of us can control the dark side and keep it in abeyance, and others have difficulty doing that, and it just it just runs their life. And that's the, the main reason we have so much uh, violence and conflicts and wars and crimes and so on on our planet. What a depressing cycle. Well, it seems depressing. It's certainly depressing to us on Earth, especially if you're the victim of crime. Uh, it, it seems very depressing, or if somebody uh, close to you is murdered or injured or whatever. Uh, but... You know, as I say, back in the spirit side, when you get there, you will look upon it as just a learning experience and you will say, OK, well, uh, I followed my script pretty quick, carefully or I didn't. And I made a lot of mistakes. And uh, we all have a life review after we finish our incarnations and we go over our lives in great detail so we can see where we messed up, um, where we did good, uh, where we went off course. And that helps us plan our next incarnation mm -hmm. so we can come back and say, I'm going to do better next time. Okay, well, look, I've heard my, my radio hero, Art Bell, in America on air, talk about this, and I'm exactly the same about it. I've heard him say, when he's talked about things like this on air, that, uh, you know, he said about himself, and I say about myself, I've tried to do the best for people, and I've been, I hope, a good guy. I've tried to help people. But there have been times in my life when life went perhaps unintentionally, or perhaps as I pursued my career or whatever stupid goals I've been following at the time, that I've hurt people. And I, I'm not proud of that, and I think most people probably one way or another have done that in work or relationships or whatever. You know, you grow up and you learn, and even if you try to be good, those things happen. Are you saying that in the life review at the end of time, all of that's going to be uh, just like your, uh, just like the uh, receipt you get from the, the till when you go supermarket shopping? It's all going to be down there. Oh, yes. Yeah. And, and, and everything that you've experienced, the good or the bad, is just adds to uh, adds, adds to your evolution, to your wisdom, to your knowledge. And, and uh, so you, you don't go when you finish your life. If you've been if you've done some bad things, you, you don't look at it and say, OK, well, uh, um, I, I really feel badly uh, about myself and, uh, and I regret all my actions uh, where I hurt other people. You look at it as a learning experience. You say, OK, I wished I hadn't done that. But, um, you know, that's the way it is. Life on Earth. That's what it's all about. And I'm going to, you know, plan my next life to try to make amends and to and to do better. And it's just, and, and you realize that, uh, you know, humans uh, have free will and they're bound to make uh, some mistakes and to hurt people. A lot of times it's unintentionally because we just don't spend enough time to think before we act and and say things. And that's that's why we uh, that's where a lot of hurt comes in. Mm. And you think we're taught some of these lessons down here? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, no, we, <laughs> we, 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 we're learning lessons all the time. Every experience in your life is, in, in a way, is a lesson, the good and the bad. And we actually learn more from the, the tragedies and the bad things in our life than from the good things. Uh, but it, it, it's all a lesson. It all helps, to, uh, helps us to evolve and uh, to become better souls, to be more advanced souls as we move through our incarnations. Well, that uh, speaks to me and is going to speak to an awful lot of people hearing this, because I, I know that as a younger man, I put my career, like a lot of us do, before all things, and now as I'm an older man, I think, what the hell was that about? What was the point? And that I've learned down here. I don't need to go back uh, to learn that. Maybe I have to go back over there to learn other things. Who knows? Interesting. Yeah. It, and, and one of the things that Albert said, which is really quite interesting, he said to me, you know, you have to look at life on Earth as an adventure and don't take things so seriously. 
because uh, no matter what you do, if you, if you make mistakes, um, you can't go wrong or become lost. You're always going to go back to the spirit side and everything you do is a, a lesson to be learned, uh, an experience that, you, uh, that will increase your wisdom and your, your knowledge and help your evolution. So, you know, Isn't that an embezzler's charter? Doesn't that mean that, you know, there I am, I'm the company accountant and I think to myself, well, actually, there's a million dollars on the balance sheet and uh, I've got the keys to the bank account. I can, I can have that. I'll take that because um, because it doesn't matter, really. Well, it, it doesn't matter on the spirit side, but it can matter here because you still have to follow secular laws. So if you want to spend uh, the next 15 years in, in a jail, <laughs> then you do that. And if you don't, if you think that your path means living outside of jail, then you don't do it. So you have to live with secular laws. But if you did embezzle and you went to jail, when you get back to the spirit side, it doesn't really matter. There's no punishment. And there's no judgment. Oh boy! Well, that, isn't that a bit of a flaw in the argument then? Because bad people doing bad things can always reconcile it for themselves, saying, "Ah, oh, geez, it's not going to matter when I get over the next side." Uh, yeah, except that a lot of people don't uh, really realize that. Um, and uh, as I say, you still have to deal with the secular laws. So even though God's not going to punish you for doing bad things, you know, the, the people who do really evil things, they're not even thinking about that anyway. Because, because for centuries, the religions have told us that if you're bad, uh, when you die, you'll be judged and go to an awful place called hell. That has never stopped people from murdering and stealing and uh, abusing other people. So uh, I, I, those people who do that, they just don't think about those things. Last quote from the books, very short. Souls choose lives and develop their life plans in order to evolve and grow or to help another soul encounter the things it needs for its evolution. Sounds to me like those two lines are about everything that you've been through. Yes, uh, and 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 really, w w where that really hits home is that is that, for example, when uh, when parents uh, lose, uh, say, a young child, a six year old child, in an accident. And they will say, well, you know, why is this child taken from me? They have, the, you know, she has her whole life ahead of her. It seems cruel uh, to her and to us. And the answer is, well, that child's soul chose to come to Earth for a very short lifetime, for six years, for a purpose, probably to help her, their parents learn a lesson uh, by losing a, a, a young child. And so that soul came here to help her parents, not because she had necessarily had anything to learn. So that happens all the time. There's lots of souls who come here, uh, not necessarily for their whole life to, to, to help somebody else, but help other people here and there with their, um, with their evolution. Pres that's presumably you would note. never tell a grieving parent that, though, because that's not going to help them in their, in their moment of need, is it? Well, actually, I would. If somebody, if I haven't run into anybody, but I would tell them that. I would say, look at your little goal girl died because her soul was ready to leave, and she came here for a very short period of time. So it was all planned. She's on the other side. She's very well looked after. Uh, she's very happy, and you will meet her again someday. And I would hope that that would help a, a, a grieving parents, uh, you know, get over their grief. That's interesting because I have to say, as I've talked on this show before, I lost my parents and was very close to them. And uh, and I miss them every day. And the thing that keeps me going is that I'm going to meet them again. So you say I will. Okay. You yeah, absolutely you will. And okay. In fact, they're watching over you right now, Howard, and, and, and cheering you on. Well, he is hoping. I, I have a feeling they might be, but uh, it's not about me, this. It's about you. Uh, talk to me about the new book then briefly. Tell me what you're involved in now. Well, the, 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 you mean my second book? Yeah. Or my third book? No, well, what, the thing that you're writing now. Oh, well, I'm not writing. I finished my third book. My second book, Dancing Forever with Spirit, was about my astro first set of astral trips to the spirit side and other places. My third book is another set of astral uh, uh, travels with Albert. Um, and it's called Dance of Heavenly Bliss. And it will be published, uh, will be released in early 2016. And it's more adventures with Albert. Uh, he takes me to different places. I meet some very interesting souls on the spirit side. And there's there's lessons and nuggets of wisdom, hopefully, for everyone in, uh, in, in those books, both second and third. What do your readers tell you? Um, I get very good comments from readers. Uh, I've had a few negative comments that say, oh, yeah, this is a bunch of uh, uh, horse manure and, uh, <laughs> you, you know, you're just making this all up. But that's that that's the exception. Most of the comments are very good. A lot of people say, you know, I really believed everything that you were told by Albert. And this gives me great validation that what I had believed already before is true. And so I get some really good comments from from readers. Good news. If people want to know more about you, presumably you have a website place where they can go. Yes, my website is garnetshulhalser.com. That's hard to remember, so you can also get to there by doing dancingonastamp.com. 
uh, or if you just Google Dancing on a Staff, you'll get to my page. And there's, uh, th there's a, a synopsis for each book on my website. You can watch a book video. You can download a free excerpt for each book. Um, and there's buy links there where you can just click on it and get to all the popular online bookstores to buy my books. And my email address is there as well. And I'd love to hear from your listeners. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, that's very comprehensive, Garnet. And uh, just finally, one question. Why dancing on a stamp? Well, it, it, it is because at one point in my dialogue with Albert, I was complaining about something not going right in my life. And he said, you know, your problem is, he said, if you look at, at life on earth, it's like you're being in this big, beautiful ballroom. And there's de the dance band is playing fantastic dance music. Everyone around you is swirling and dancing around the floor. But I've spent, he said to me, you spent too much of your time on one spot like you have leg shackles on and you need to break out of your shackles, get out of your comfort zone and quit dancing on a stamp. And I that's think where the title came from. That's great advice to us all, I think, Garnet. Thank you very much indeed. Good to talk with you. Um, I, let's, let's talk again. Um, if you have more contact with Albert, uh, if something happens, get in touch, let me know. Thank you very much for coming on. Thank you for having me, Howard. Boy, we are out of time. Links to Garnet Schulhauser on my website, theunexplained.tv. The website designed and made and created and honed by Adam Cornwell at Creative Hotspot. Thank you very much to you for staying in touch with me here at The Unexplained. Please keep your emails coming if you want to get in touch. Make a guest suggestion. Tell me what you think of it all. Uh, then I'll be very pleased to hear from you. Go to theunexplained.tv and there you can click on a link and send me an email or you can make a donation to the show if you'd like to. Got a rush now. We're out of time. Thank you very much indeed. Until next we meet here on The Unexplained, my name is Howard Hughes. I am in London. And please stay safe, stay calm and stay in touch. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye. <laughs>